Chapter Thirteen of the Heart of Philura by Florence Morse Kingsley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Thirteen Not at Home to Visitors. The sun was still an hour above the horizon when Mrs. Pettibone, somewhat shaken and pale of face after her half hour alone with grief, came forth into the soft light of the afternoon. She would have time, she thought to walk the scant mile which separated her from the scene of Milly Orne's new activities. Mrs. Pettibone was not a very astute person, being amiably inclined to take every one at his own valuation. In place of worldly wisdom, however, she was often aware of intuitions, familiarly known as feelings, not to be denied or otherwise put down, and these feelings, she found, were timidly but no less stubbornly arrayed against the higher dicta of an idealistic philosophy as she proceeded resolutely on her way. She decided that since she had herself assisted in bringing about the change in Milly Orne's life, she must somehow control its consequences, not knowing that consequences, like other seemingly blind forces in nature, cannot be controlled. But her resolution, however futile, served to give poise and even a degree of boldness to her manner, as in due time she mounted the steps in front of the old Eggleston mansion. Milly herself, prettier than ever in a fresh blue gingham and frilly white apron, opened the door. The ladies, she said, were not at home. Then she blushed very prettily. She told me to say it, she whispered. It means they don't want to see anybody. Miss Hill says it's perfectly proper. "'But I may come in and see you, Milly?' The girl hesitated, gazing at her pastor's wife from under her long, curved lashes. "'I um, I might walk with you a piece,' she said doubtfully. "'But if you come in, I shall have to take you to the kitchen. You see, I'm being trained.' Mrs. Pettibone frowned quite pretentiously for a person with no eyebrows to speak of. "'I see you are,' she said while the recalcitrant feelings surged up very strong indeed within her. After a moment of natural hesitation, she added, "'I'm coming round to the kitchen, my dear. It won't hurt me in the least, and now that I think of it, I've often visited with Miss Minerva Eggleston in the kitchen when she happened to be busy. I know the place very well.' Milly thought that was different, but she obediently closed the door while Mrs. Pettibone picked her way through the long grass to the rear entrance. Of the closeted ladies within, there was no sign, though she fancied she detected the low murmur of voices floating out from an open window. "'This is a real nice kitchen,' Milly said, with faint embarrassment, as she set forth a well-scrubbed chair for her visitor. "'Oh, yes, it is,' agreed Mrs. Pettibone, glancing around the old room, the scene of Miss Minerva Eggleston's slow metamorphosis from defiant youth to resigned middle age. You, I hope, you find it pleasant here? The girl hesitated, looking down at her reddened fingers. There is a great deal of hard work to do, she said, but I don't mind that. I am all the time thinking about the nice new roof we'll have next winter, and the cow. I can buy the cow for Grandfather before long. And you don't mind, well, Mrs. Hill is considerate? Milly looked up quickly her lips parting in a doubtful smile. "'Well, it, it isn't as if I had to stay always,' she said. "'I couldn't do that. But just this summer I don't mind very much.' Mrs. Pettibone reflected soberly. It would not be right, she was thinking, to instill the poison of evil suspicion into the girl's mind. And what indeed was there to suspect? Milly was gazing at her intently. "'You've been to see my grandmother, haven't you?' Mrs. Pettibone did not deny it. And she's worried about me, and now you're wondering whether I... But you see, Grandmother's always been worried about me, ever since I can remember. Of course, it's foolish. Milly smiled, revealing the edges of her pretty teeth. She'll be glad next winter, though, won't she? Oh, I'm sure I hope so, murmured the minister's wife mechanically. She was skirting her way about the difficult subject of which she wished to speak, timidly intent upon her duty. And you, have you become better acquainted with Mrs. Walter Hill? She propounded after a pause. She seems very young, about your own age, I would say. 
Millie shook her head. She was still smiling, as if she had already guessed what her visitor was thinking, and found it faintly amusing. "'Young Mrs. Hill doesn't notice me at all,' she said frankly. "'I never see her to speak to her.' Mrs. Pettibone's childish eyes expressed disappointment. "'Oh, I'm sorry for that,' she said. "'I thought perhaps a cheerful young girl like yourself, well, my... "'And Mrs. Hill, the mother? You are naturally with her a good deal. "'Mrs. Hill is always with her daughter. "'Of course I see her mornings sometimes out here, or when she tells me things, like today." A conscious flush rose to Mrs. Pettibone's faded cheek. "'You must be very lonely here.' she concluded, with what she felt to be Machiavellian duplicity. "'I should be, if it weren't for Mr. Hill,' said Milly. "'He's very kind.' "'Kind?' echoed the minister's wife, very pink and agitated. "'Kind?' "'Well, you see, Mrs. Hill seems to forget that I'm here sometimes,' explained Milly. "'And if it weren't for Mr. Hill, I shouldn't know what to do always.' where to find things i mean and what to have for dinner and isn't that just a little odd my dear questioned the minister's wife her voice trembling hasn't mr hill anything to do any business or oh, one might think he would be very much occupied with his wife milly again shook her head a troubled pucker appearing between her brows i don't pretend to understand anything here she said under her breath Oughtn't I to do my work as well as I can, and not try to understand? These people will go away in the fall, and I shall never see them any more. But just now, I can help them, cooking their meals and keeping everything tidy. And, oh, I'm not old or wise like Grandmother. But why should I be afraid of anything or anyone, as long as I do the best I can to help? The girl's face, as she said this, wore a look so innocently sweet and strong that Mrs. Pettibone felt suddenly ashamed of her little hoard of worldly wisdom. She took the rough little hand in both her own. "'You're a good girl, Millie,' she said warmly. "'If you will just trust God to guide you, and keep on helping—' The girl's expression changed subtly, and Mrs. Pettibone, suddenly aware of an unfriendly presence in the room, turned to face the mistress of the house. Mrs. Hill advanced a few steps, her face twisted in an odd smile, her plump hands moving slowly, the one over the other. "'I thought I heard voices,' she said blandly. "'In the country, it seems, one must secure one's privacy behind locked doors.' Mrs. Pettibone's eyes opened very wide and blue, suddenly blinked as if she had received a dash of cold water full in the face. "'I had no thought of intruding,' she said, with surprising dignity. "'I came to call on you and your daughter. "'But I meant to ask for Milly. "'Indeed, I came chiefly to see whether she was happy in her position here, "'since I, in a way, am responsible for her presence in your house.' "'Mrs. Hill moved her large shoulders deprecatingly. "'You quite misunderstand me, my dear Mrs. Pettibone.' I beg to assure you we fully appreciate your interest in our affairs. Uh, won't you... Uh, I think I should like to speak to you for a moment. Her gesture peremptorily reminded the small person in drab alpaca to the room from which she had so quietly emerged a moment before. Mrs. Pettibone remained standing after two doors had closed noiselessly behind them. She was swiftly reviewing the conversation she had just had with Millie Orne and wondering what she ought to have said in view of the facts. Mrs. Hill pointed to a chair. "'Kindly be seated,' she said coldly. "'It occurs to me that, since I am employing a servant, in whom so many persons appear to take an interest—' Mrs. Pettibone's eyes conveyed an indignant question, which Mrs. Hill proceeded at once to answer. "'I am not referring altogether to yourself, Mrs. Pettibone. Your own solicitude for the girl is certainly natural. I might say, in a way, professional. But there are others.' the tradespeople and the girl's relatives. Really, it's quite extraordinary. I think you must have misunderstood what I said to you about Milly, began Mrs. Pettibone. She is not... Mrs. Hill waved her hand. We'll not go into that, she said dryly. Granted, the girl is what persons of her class call a perfect lady. She nevertheless possesses a tongue, 
and doubtless forms opinions she has told me nothing began mrs pettibone yet you were cross-questioning her with considerable adroitness what do you want to know the minister's wife suddenly bethought herself of the presbyterial dignities which she represented her manner as she rose to her feet conveyed a rebuke commensurate to the offence i can see very little use in talking with you she said slowly you are not you'd like to tell me i'm not a lady smiled mrs hill oh no don't go there's something i want you to hear from me mrs pettibone had drawn her little figure to its full height looking down at the woman who remained seated with grave dignity we came here mrs hill went on without apparent perturbation in order that we might be quite alone and unnoticed one would suppose that in a remote country place like this one might oh, don't interrupt me if you please i acknowledge i am beaten and so i shall tell you something of ourselves and you will oblige me by repeating it to the persons in your parish who may be interested i think i should prefer not to mrs hill smiled disagreeably oh but i insist kindly understand i am taking you into my confidence mrs pettibone because you are the wife of the local clergyman and i very much prefer to have you tell people about us oh, quite naturally you know at an afternoon tea perhaps or the church social to having salter the grocer or the old woman who comes to see my maid retail the impressions of that worthy young woman of course i understand that personally you feel no curiosity or take no interest as you call it in us or our affairs but you do take an interest in the girl milly as you have proved this afternoon mrs pettibone took two steps toward the door an indignant exclamation escaping her lips the woman sat quite motionless watching her narrowly if i should tell you i'm in deep trouble you would listen wouldn't you i thought so now sit down there's a good creature and let me tell you but she did not speak further for a long minute during which mrs pettibone nervously examined the tips of her shabby gloves it was her duty she thought to hear what the woman had to say when you met my son's wife in the woods some weeks ago resumed mrs hill with dry deliberation did she impress you as being quite rational mrs pettibone hesitated recalling the wild looks and gestures of the tragic young figure she seemed to be in deep trouble of some kind she said slowly like one who's kept something hidden for so long that it burst out as a kind of relief the woman's lashes lifted with a jerk then she told you what did she say oh she did not know that i was anywhere about at first and i didn't understand it was all incoherent you spoke to her i asked her to tell me what was the matter i was very much surprised to meet anyone in those woods we hadn't heard the place was let well you asked her and she told you i thought at first she was a mere child her hair was hanging in a long braid the woman made an impatient gesture she likes it best that way she told you what oh she said she was married and that her name was sylvia cruden is that all all that i can think of mrs pettibone looked directly at her inquisitor i can think of nothing else she repeated mrs hill was staring at her with curious intentness that is sylvia's illusion she said she thinks she is married to another man of course it's very painful for me to speak of this very painful for my son she will recover of course in due time on that score we have no anxiety no anxiety whatsoever the woman's voice rang flat and insincere and why do you tell me this asked the minister's wife because i want you to know it you can explain if anyone asks you that we do not receive visitors and we are not in need of popular sympathy which is merely another word for officious curiosity mrs pettibone stood up her little figure still panoplied in presbyterial dignity i'm sorry for your daughter she murmured 
and for you i am not curious as you seem to think i only wanted to help mrs hill's face twisted painfully as if the words had touched a hidden spring of violent emotion and then her features composed themselves into their usual expressionless calm in a case of this kind nothing can be done by an outsider she said in a slow cold voice i shall do for sylvia what must be done no one can help mrs pettibone moved quietly toward the door when she had reached it she turned and looked at the woman who still sat stolidly in her chair by the window her face in the waning afternoon light curiously resembling a mask of old ivory with motionless eyes of jade i shall not come again said mrs pettibone unless you send for me and i shall not speak of what you have told me i can see no reason for doing so as for milly i think you can trust her she may not be a lady after your way of thinking but she is true and good and she will do what she can to make things easier for you End of chapter 13Chapter 14 of The Heart of Philura by Florence Morse Kingsley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 14 Millie Drives the Cow. The narrow country road, hardly more than a wagon track between opposing walls of greenery, was pleasantly cool and moist with a recent shower. Here and there a sun warmed puddle reflected the dazzling blue of the sky and furnished a playground for innumerable butterflies, white and pale yellow, which fluttered and lifted before the sedate steps of a dun cow, only to settle again, their gay wings moving gently like wind-blown blossoms. Wild roses, in their first frail bloom, painted the wayside with splashes of pink, and tall bull-thistles, beloved of flying things, lifted their mailed heads of purple and white among the twinkling leaves. There was a warm, sweet smell of newly unfolded ferns and wild strawberries hiding in the tall grass. The dun cow would have paused to munch and consider, but the girl walking behind gently urged her forward with light flicks of the leafy branch she carried. And so in due time the cow, thinking her bovine thoughts of grass and sweet-smelling clover in the meadows beyond, and the girl smiling with joyous anticipation covered the scant mile of their journey grandfather orne was weeding the onions a task requiring concentrated attention when the eyes of the worker can scarcely distinguish betwixt the slender onion shoots and the thrifty young weeds crowding close and greedy his dull ears failed to apprise him of the deliberate footfalls of the dun cow as she was skilfully induced by the combined action of the girl and the leafy bough to pass through the deftly drawn bars here were shade and stretches of green grass and the sound of water running over smooth stones the dun cow gazed about her with placid eyes of contentment the girl stood watching the cow for a gleeful moment then gathering her skirts about her slipped through the hedge and across the garden her light feet making no sound on the soft earth grandfather the old man raised himself with a grunt eh what what oh milly <laughs> oh, where do you come from i'd like to know from the pasture grandfather ah oh, come cross lots eh well you sure are growin seems to me you look taller and bigger every time i see you seen your grandma not yet the girl's demure face conveyed a subtle sense of mystery her blue eyes danced under the wind-blown tendrils of her blonde hair. She put up her hand to push them away. "'I bet you've been up to something or other,' chuckled the old man, sitting back on his haunches and peering up with an air of superior sagacity. "'I always knowed when you was getting ready for mischief. <laughs> I used to tell your grandma. Keep an eye on her,' I says. "'There's something doing when Milly gets that spark in her eye. <laughs> I remember how you upset the beehive one day to see if there was any honey oh we didn't have to smack you for that the bees seen to it you was tended to good and proper the girl's laugh rang out 
i remember she said it isn't bees this time oh not bees eh well i guess you'd better go in and find your grandma she's always talking about you from morning till night and i guess she dreams about you most every night <laughs> i had to shake her good last night to wake her up she was a whining and crying in her sleep and what on earth's the matter with your mother i says and come to find out she'd been dreaming some fool thing or other about you <laughs> milly's smile faded i wish grandmother wouldn't worry about me she said soberly can't you make her stop grandfather you see i'm grown up now and know how to take care of myself the old man blew a resounding blast on his red bandana handkerchief shucks he said defiantly you might as well try to keep the old red cow from chewing on her cud i guess your grandma enjoys worrying full as much and does it as constant the girl laughed outright and then she caught the old man by the sleeve look she commanded pointing to the pasture where the dun cow was making leisurely survey of her new domain Hey, what what in creation where'd that critter come from blowed if it don't look like say i know you'd been up to something can't fool your grandpa she's part jersey grandfather oh, wait i'll run and get grandmother she's all yours yours and grandmother's but grandmother was already pushing past the unpruned rose bushes which stood guard over the vegetable patch scattering showers of pale pink leaves from their lavish bloom she took the girl in her arms with a little tender cry of joy i dreamed last night you was in some sort of trouble she quavered and thinks i i'll go up to the farm this afternoon and see milly oh but you're all right ain't you dearie oh land i've been so worried all the morning now you see how foolish it is chided the girl i'm as right as right can be what did i tell ye crowed the old man chewing the cud of trouble all the enduring while well, coming out at past your mother and let's see what we can find you'll have to look close your eyesight ain't what it was a spell back and thus the chief conspirator and her gleeful coadjutor guilefully baited the credulous old lady the dun cow had got into the pasture somehow or other did grandmother think she looked like one of farmer craddock's herd and how was she ever to be restored to her proper owner oh, i bet milly here couldn't drive a cow to save her life piped grandfather anyway not a frisky young heifer like that say she looks like some jersey to me come on grandma let's take a good squint at her i got a good mind to milk her it'd be a charity oh, i would grandfather chimed in milly i'll go and get your stool and the pail you do not near the kind cried the scandalized old woman she ought to be driven home right off it's full early for milking yet oh, i don't see how in creation that critter got into the pasture cogitated grandfather scratching his head the bars is up they've been up all day by cracky she must have jumped clean over the fence fetch that stool here milly i'm going to milk as sure as you're a foot high and i'll bet i get such a pailful as you ain't seen in one good while you got plenty of clean pans grandma but here milly being soft-hearted told grandmother between laughing and crying how she had bought the cow the evening before and paid for her with the wages she had earned grandmother wiped her eyes and kissed the girl's glowing cheek oh, dear dear she murmured it's awful nice to have the cow but honey i don't like your living up there along of them strange folks or maybe they're all right i know you say they be but they're strange to me and i don't like the looks of that woman they're going away in november milly said soothingly going where demanded mrs orne suspiciously oh, back where they came from i suppose they're only here for the summer where'd they come from 
I should think some of them had named the place by now. But Milly didn't know. She thought it didn't matter anyhow. Tain't natural, contradicted Mrs. Orne. You needn't tell me. If I was to go away some place for the summer, don't you suppose I'd tell folks where I come from? Well, I guess. Wouldn't wait for em to ask, neither. Milly pulled a pink rose from the bush, her white forehead puckered thoughtfully. Oh, well, we're different, she said slowly. We don't like hiding things or having secrets. Some people make a secret of most anything. I guess they're that kind. They don't want to be friends with the people round here. Jerusalem crickets, cried Grandfather, who had just returned from a jubilant inspection of the new cow. That there critter's more an half years earlier, I'm a liar. We can make butter, Mother. I bet you could beat them creamery folks all holler. Mrs. Orne smiled tolerantly, her eyes on her granddaughter. Oh, going to stay to supper, ain't you, dearie? She asked wistfully, but Milly shook her head. She must hurry home, she said, to get dinner. The two old folks stood watching the girl's slim figure till it was on the point of disappearing behind a clump of trees. You don't want to stand and watch her out of sight, warned Grandmother, carefully averting her eyes. Oh, don't you suppose I know that, retorted Grandfather indignantly. Anyhow, you've told me enough times. Blame fool notion, I say. Well, I suppose I'd feel some easier about Milly if them folks didn't eat their dinner at night quavered grandmother plaintively it don't seem christian like dinner or supper can't see as it's gonna hurt milly none spluttered grandfather if folks want to name their meals up different what do you care and if they'd only say right out that they was from some place or other we knowed about Darn it cried grandfather just as i was feeling good about the cow yes i will say it makes me feel a sight better double dern so there i guess i'd better be going in the house commented grandmother quite pink with righteous anger she turned after a few steps her round old face aglow with the light of a fresh purpose seeing we got the new cow she said with fine forgetfulness how would you like some nice batter cakes for supper grandpa i can afford the milk now how'd i like em piped grandfather well you just fry up a good dish of em mother and see what'll catch em once i get through milkin <laughs> end of chapter fourteen Chapter Fifteen of the Heart of Philura by Florence Morse Kingsley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Fifteen, on the Old Road. A large round moon, coloured like the pale wings of the butterflies, floated in the soft rose of the eastern sky, as Milly Orne walked swiftly along the road. She was thinking happily of the two old people she had left behind, and of the dun cow with her pretty, sleek head and large, mild eyes. Grandfather would be milking her now. She wished she might have waited to see the first foaming pail carried into the kitchen. But there was the dinner to finish and serve. Being quick-witted, and moreover of an acquisitive mind, Milly had studiously applied herself to the study of Miss Minerva Eggleston's old-fashioned cookbook, and thereby learned many strange combinations and permutations of the familiar potatoes and meat served at Innisfield tables. Cooking, she had learned, was a science, not to be disdained or thought lightly of, and since the strangers she served appeared increasingly appreciative of the fruits of her newly acquired knowledge, Milly continued to study and experiment with ever-growing pleasure in her work. She was thinking doubtfully of a certain delicate pudding compounded for the first time and at present awaiting its destined hour in the cool seclusion of the spring room had she beaten the eggs sufficiently she wondered was the meringue which topped the confection over brown she stepped daintily about the edges of a puddle her blue eyes bent upon the ground when as once before she heard the swift tread of hoofs behind her and looked back 
to meet Walter Hill's dark gaze. Mindful of her freshly starched skirts and the threatening mud puddle, Milly hastily took refuge amid the leafy grove of the roadside till the rider should pass. But the young man pulled his horse to a standstill and slipped from his saddle. Milly watched him with surprise as he walked towards her, the bay horse at his heels. "'You've been home?' he asked, his face lighted with a boyish smile. "'Do you know I thought I might overtake you?' Milly said nothing being vaguely troubled by his presence and the look in his eyes. "'I happened to see you start out from Craddock's,' he went on easily. "'How did my Lady Jersey behave? And what did they say to her?' "'You mean Grandfather and Grandmother?' inferred Milly, walking very fast, her eyes on the distant glimmer of white which represented the old Eggleston house. "'They were glad, of course.' He put out his hand as if to guide her past a particularly deep puddle but she drew back, a quick flush staining her cheek. "'You didn't seem to be looking,' he apologised. "'Another instant and you'd have been in over your shoe-tops, you know. Oh, it is rather wet along here in spots.' "'Yes,' she admitted coldly, "'but I've walked in muddy roads all my life.' He studied her averted face with a slight clouding of his dark good looks. "'What have I done that you won't even look at me, Milly?' he asked after a lengthening pause. "'This morning you were as jolly as could be, only you wouldn't let me beat the eggs.' His tone was slightly aggrieved. "'If you please, Mr. Hill, I'd rather you wouldn't wait for me,' she said determinedly. "'I'm late, I know, but—' "'You're not late,' he contradicted her. "'And besides, it's beautiful. Look at that moon, will you? It, it's somehow like you, Milly all soft rose and pale gold and the girl hurried on faster than before but his long stride kept him abreast of her oh don't be angry he begged that bit of foolishness slipped out before i thought but see here i want to tell you something she shook her head i haven't time to listen she objected there's no real reason why we shouldn't be friends you're mistaken she said proudly Besides, I don't wish to be friends with you. It's absurd even to speak of it. But why, he urged, is it because I, because of Sylvia? Can't a man have friends, even if... It's because of, of everything. You oughtn't to be talking to me at all. Mrs. Hill would be displeased. His face had grown suddenly dark. Granted that we can't be friends, he said doggedly. I'm going to tell you one thing. I was on the point of bolting when you came. I couldn't have stood it another day. Oh, you don't know. Don't judge me, not knowing. She was looking at him, her blue eyes wide with unconcealed scorn. You're telling me you would have left your wife and your mother alone in that lonely house? Oh, well, I suppose I should have come back. Don't look at me that way, Milly. I'm not as bad as you think. Have you no pity? she asked, her voice breaking a little. No love? Yes, he said sullenly. That's why I'm here. But I didn't know what it was going to be like. He shook his head, his brows knit over gloomy eyes. No, I swear I didn't grasp the situation. How could I? Well, you saved the day, Milly, whether you meant to or not. I didn't bolt, and for your sake, I won't. I'll stick it out, even if Sylvia... But I mustn't speak to you of her. You wouldn't understand. You couldn't. She turned and faced him with sudden courage. Why don't you stay with her more? she demanded. Surely you ought to be able to comfort her. Help her as no one else can. It's entirely natural you should think so, he admitted, a tinge of bitterness in his tone. But Sylvia doesn't happen to want me. My presence irritates her. Did you ever hear of a marriage of convenience? Which is no marriage at all. His short laugh held no mirth. I can't expect you to be sorry for me, he went on, in face of her troubled silence. I don't ask it, but 
some time i may be able to explain until that hour comes promise me you will at least give me the benefit of the doubt don't pass sentence in the dark her candid eyes searched his face swiftly if she read truth there and a desperate struggle with some unknown emotion the girl made no sign she hesitated for a moment her face with its delicate pure outlines pale in the soft delighted dusk i certainly have no right to judge you or any one harshly she said at last if i seem to have done so forgive me he did not attempt to follow her as she went swiftly from him into the gathering night as she fled up the long drive she heard the thud of hoofs growing fainter on the road below mrs hill's large presence confronted the girl at the door of the kitchen you are late she said with a rebuking glance at the clock i had begun to wonder if i must prepare the dinner myself oh i am very sorry milly apologized quite breathless with haste and the shock of her late encounter where have you been demanded mrs hill darting a quick look into the luminous dusk without milly somewhat accustomed by now to her mistress's sharp incisive questions answered without embarrassment did you see no one beside your grandparents the girl hesitated for the space of a frightened heartbeat or two i saw mr hill she murmured her eyes intent upon the potato she had hurriedly begun to peel you saw mr hill where on the road as i was coming home do you mean he passed you i haven't heard him come in the girl was conscious of the woman's probing eyes upon her face i think he went by the other road she stammered the moon it's it's very light and pleasant out of doors her hands shook over their task mrs hill's mouth twisted in a wry smile so i see she said dryly she stood for a moment watching the girl's nervous fingers with cold interest you may serve dinner she ordered as soon as possible we will not wait for mr hill milly heard the retreating rustle of her gown with a sigh of relief but when she ventured to lift her abashed eyes she was startled to see the tall stout figure standing motionless by the door as if lost in deep thought you're a very pretty girl mrs hill observed harshly quite unusually so for a person of your class but let me remind you that your position in my house depends entirely upon your discretion you understand me i am sure the leaping colour in milly's face and the indignant flash of her blue eyes appeared to satisfy the woman checking with an imperious gesture the girl's half-uttered exclamation she swept from the room left to herself milly orne dropped her knife and started toward the door i will not stay in this house she told herself with sudden passion i'll go home there would be a joyful welcome awaiting her there she knew but how explain her unlooked-for change of mind and the leaky old roof only this afternoon she thought happily of the heavy rains sure to come in late autumn and of the tight new shingles which would shelter the two ailing old people slowly she walked back to the table slowly took up her knife and went on peeling the potatoes afar off echoing from some distant fold of the hills came the rhythmic beat of a galloping horse End of chapter 15 Chapter 16 of The Heart of Philura by Florence Morse Kingsley This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 16 Malvina Bennett Points a Moral Miss Malvina Bennett transferred a pin from her mouth to the heart-shaped cushion on the front of her gown with a quick, darting motion of her right hand, while with her left she gently propelled the lady she was fitting to a proper position before the mirror. "'There now, Miss Salter,' cried the little dressmaker. "'How'd you like the set of that waist? Ain't that 
bias drape over the left shoulder stylish it's the very latest from paris mrs salter was a thin stooped woman with a lavender tinted complexion lightly shaded with red about the tip of her pinched nose and the edges of her sparsely furnished eyelids she sighed heavily as she surveyed the inchoate garment she was wearing seems to me she murmured there's a pucker right under the left shoulder blade oh, of course there is confirmed miss bennett with professional superiority i ain't put no pattern in there yet you see you all are right in where some folks bulges out i know i do acknowledged mrs salter with mournful pride i ain't got no lung to speak of on that side ain't had for years and years the doctor says it's a perfect miracle i've lived as long as i have tis wonderful chirped miss bennett her head with its second best false front very much to one side anyway you lasted out lots of big strong-looking folks i could name say i'm going to drape the skirt back and front like they make em this year it's awful becoming to thin folks but land i do hope regular bunched over skirts ain't coming in again i used to pretty nigh go crazy over some of the goods that come in the shop getting them to loop just so talk about looping the loop and basques with eight seams in the back all boned remember how we used to make em mrs salter i just got on to a secret way of shaping the darts in the front when poof they went out of style like you'd blow out a candle <laughs> oh, just a second mrs salter till i stick a pin in under the arm and cut out the neck a mite hmm. yes low necks is going to be wore this season and elbow sleeves i'll make em that way if you say so but don't you think seeing as you're so uh, kind of bony anyway my bones is small said mrs salter with an acrimonious sniff <laughs> that's more than some folks can say so they be awful small and delicate conceded miss bennett soothingly i hardly ever fit anybody with your waist measure there now i'll get you out of this right off Mrs. Salter sank into a chair with a dismal moan. "'You got it off me just in time, Malvina,' she announced weakly. "'One minute more and I'd have keeled right over. "'No, <clears throat> when can I expect this dress? I'm in kind of a hurry, "'cause Mr. Salter's first wife's aunt is coming to visit, "'and of course I want to look nice for her.' Miss Bennett was setting long basting stitches, her thin lips puckered over a mouthful of pins. Mm, let me see, she mumbled, a glint of anticipatory joy in her eyes. Tomorrow I'm going out to sew. I hadn't any idea of doing such a thing. As a rule, I only take in. But to accommodate... Well, I want to know, commented Mrs. Salter acidly. Me a trudging over here to be fitted with my weak heart it can be letter in the mail miss bennett went on pausing to restore the pins to her cushion in full enjoyment of the dramatic interval well you were saying it come in the mail prompted mrs salter with a hacking cough indicative of suppressed exasperation you could have knocked me down with a feather stated miss bennett searching busily among the properties on her table did you bring over any hooks and eyes mrs salter yes i did a full card they were the new kind you can't undo unless you try real hard oh yes here they be but there seems to be two gone mrs salter pinned her collar with an indignant glance at the dressmaker it was a full card she repeated right out of the store oh i remember i sewed two of them on your waist already oh now let me see I'll work on your dress today when I ain't busy with fittings. Miss Reverend Pettibone's coming in this afternoon. She been there, of course, so she can tell me. I always hate to sew for strangers unless I know something about em, good or bad. Mrs. Salter put on her hat, jabbing home the large rhinestone pins with the effect of skewers. 
who under the canopy be you talking about malvina bennett she inquired with acrimony you run on so kind of wild and rambling a body might think you was losing your mind miss bennett smiled complacently but her black eyes snapped oh i guess i got my faculties all right she said demurely but speaking of crazy folks have you heard whether the woman that lives up to the old eggleston place is in her right mind i dunno as i'd want to go if my grief you ain't going there to sew mm-hmm murmured miss bennett rendered once more temporarily speechless with pins mrs salter gently chafed the end of her thin nose with a highly starched and perfumed pocket handkerchief which she slowly unfolded from a rigid blue-white square well of course mr salter's been going up there regular ever since they come so i don't suppose as anybody in town knows any more about em than i do when it comes to that oh interrogated miss bennett gazing at her customer over the top of her spectacles they buy quite a bill of groceries every week pursued mrs salter moving toward the door well i guess i'll be going now when you get my dress done don't be in such a hurry miss salter i was going to tell you you'll have to come in the last of the week to try on that waist again after i put in the padding a mite too much or too little makes an awful sight of difference in the set i suppose you've heard milly orne's helping out up there at the farm vouchsafe mrs salter her hand on the door they treat her like a common hired girl obed says she eats off the kitchen table if i was you i'd oh you don't have to worry none about her chirped miss bennett me and milly gits along first rate there ain't a nicer girl in this town well you'll find milly orne won't have nothing to say about the folks she works for sniffed mrs salter she ain't hardly said aye yes or no to mr salter for all he goes there's constant and him taking an interest and like that but obed he, he, he ain't no kind of hand to notice what folks wear can't you tell me i says patient what mrs hill had on when she come out into the kitchen to give you the order and obed he shakes his head i think it was something kind of drab he says uncertain with white on it or black i disremember which <laughs> but there was one thing he did take notice of the young lady give him a letter to mail last monday just as he was going to the gate she was standing there hid behind a big bush waiting for him to come out obed says her eyes was big and scared looking and she kept a twist in her head back toward the house as if she expected somebody might be looking did he take the letter inquired miss bennett with breathless interest yes he did but no sooner had he driv out the gate with the letter in his pocket than he heard somebody a hollering after him it was mrs hill she's kind of fleshy obed says but for all that she run like a deer i forgot something she says panting like she'd ever stroke it was a bottle of some queer kind of sauce they certainly do eat the most outlandish victuals i don't see how milly orne can do their cooking well murmured miss bennett with a touch of impatience mrs salter sucked in her thin lips with an air of virtuous reserve i guess i'd better say no more ain't none of our business as obed says if she did want to get the letter back but there can't nobody help taking an interest broke in the little dressmaker eagerly there's one thing about me i don't never gossip as i tell mother i won't have no gossiping in my shop but there's a big difference between gossiping malicious and taking a deep interest in folks a body might as well be a buried corpse and have done with it if we didn't open our mouths to say a word that's the way i feel approved the grocer's wife well what she'd really come after was that letter she smiled pleasant and told obed it wasn't directed right so she'd take it up to the house and fix it he couldn't do nothing but give it to her of course who was it directed to breathed the little dressmaker 
wish i could tell you said mrs salter resentfully if it had been me i'd have seen to that before i put the letter in my pocket but obed he said he was figuring on looking at it careful after he got out the side of the house ain't that just like a man exactly agreed miss bennett warmly well if she was to ask me to mail a letter i pretend i lost it for i'd give it up i don't know why but i always feel like taking the part of young folks maybe it's because i feel young inside for all i lost my teeth and most of me hair you might mention casual you'd pass the post office on the way home suggested mrs salter but don't for mercy's sake let on i told you she might lay it to me and stop ordering off obed you don't have to worry none i guess i'd ought to know how to manage all kinds of folks by now seems as men and women ain't no different from hooks and eyes often and often i've thought about it settin here alone in my shop you've got to know how to match em up right for one thing and it does seem as though the lord made mistakes that way putting two hooks opposite that won't jibe no matter what you do <laughs> or else sewing on an eye two sizes too big for the hook or mrs salter tossed her head with matronly arrogance i suppose an unmarried female does get queer notions o living alone so constant she said as she opened the door but there can't nobody understand men folks unless they's married to one of them oh, i thank the lord i ain't every night of my life on bended knee retaliated the little dressmaker with spirit when i look around this here town and see the poor spiritless critters some of em actually drove to drink by their wives and others of em not are in the victuals they put in their mouths but mrs salter was already halfway to the gate her rasped nose uplifted to an outraged heaven miss bennett stood on the doorstep with a pleasing sense of victory her faded eyes roving up and down the quiet street it was pleasant out of doors for an instant she considered the project of bringing her sewing down to the front stoop for the afternoon only to abandon it with a sigh there was her neuralgia for one thing so inalienable a possession that miss bennett was wont to speak of it with pride as if she'd bought and paid for it she did things on account of her neuralgia and omitted others for the same cogent reason the warm breeze which shook faint fragrance from the old-fashioned white roses in miss bennett's front yard lifted wisps of the second best false front from off her wrinkled forehead with terrifying boldness oh, if i was to set in this breeze she cogitated my neuralgia would get right up on its ear and i wouldn't sleep a wink with it to-night oh, the closer i keep it the better it is as she reached this sacrificial conclusion her eyes lighted upon her erstwhile neighbour philura pettibone walking swiftly down the street miss bennett remarked the set of her blue foulard with professional interest i never done a better job she told herself but it's out of style something scandalous <laughs> the minister's wife unlatched the gate smiling a greeting over its top at the dressmaker her cheeks were pinker than the faded rose in her hat and her blue eyes had a sort of glorified shine i'm late i know she said as she mounted the steps but mrs puffer and mrs beals came to see me this afternoon and brought all the children for the land's sake oh not the puffer twins and all i should hope was it mrs undertaker beals or her as twas jane bascom both of em's got plenty of children it was jane bascom said mrs pettibone oh malvina have you seen her littlest baby me no i ain't sniffed miss bennett jane bought her last dress ready made she had the nerve to stop me right in the street and wear in the dress and tell me she didn't have no time for getting a dress made she said sam beals bought it for her in the city before she was up and around <laughs> it looks like it i says just like that i says casting my eye down the hang of the skirt well if you're satisfied i said the baby's a girl murmured mrs pettibone softly hm, commented miss bennett 
So's all her others, ain't they? How many she got now? Five. Oh, they're all pretty children. You remember how pretty Jane used to be, Malvina? But the littlest baby, she let me hold it. Miss Bennett surveyed her pastor's wife with puzzled interest. I didn't know you were so fond of children, Philura, she said wonderingly. Oh, there I went and forgot again. Now that you're Mrs. Reverend Pettibone, I ought to remember to call you by that name. There ain't no telling how long you'll have it. Mrs. Pettibone looked startled, and the pink faded a little in her thin cheeks. Why, wh what do you mean, Malvina? Miss Bennett turned and began the ascent of the narrow stair. I can't stand here no longer in this wind with my neuralgia, she said over her shoulder. Come right and up, your waist's all basted and ready to try on. Mrs. Pettibone did not repeat her question, but her face still wore a troubled look as she obediently surveyed her small figure in Miss Bennett's mirror. No, don't you go to worrying about what I said, advised Miss Bennett as she pinned in a sleeve. I don't know what possessed me. But you kind of put me in mind of your husband's first wife just for a minute. I put you in mind? Oh, you don't look none like the first Mrs. Pettibone. No more than I do. And I guess I oughtn't to name her to you anyhow. Why not? asked the second Mrs. Pettibone in a small, weak voice. Why shouldn't you speak of her to me? Oh, I dunno. Some folks don't like to think there was anybody before em like an ostrich sticking their head in the sand, I say. I remember Miss Gus Bogart, she as twas Emmeline Post. Emmeline was his third. When she was first married, she went round the house sly, hunting up all the photos of the other two, and fast as she found em, she burnt em up in the kitchen stove. Well, Gus, he'd had a big crayon portrait of his first wife made, and hung up in the parlour, and the second Mrs. Bogart, she as twas Minnie Fisher, well, she left it hanging right over the sofa all during her time. But Emmeline took it down when Gus was off on one of his trips. She didn't durst burn it, but she put it up in the attic, way in under the eaves, and hung up in place of it a real nice premium picture she'd got for soap wrappers. It was of a lady, I remember, dressed in red, low neck and short sleeves, looking roguish to one side of a big black fan. "'Twas real handsome, and a sight cheerfuller than the crayon picture of the first Miss Bogart. Well, pretty soon, back comes Gus from his trip, and marches into the parlour, with Emmeline tagging behind, so nervous she didn't know one from t'other. Gus looks around casual, and takes out his pipe, and fills it, Emmeline watching him like a cat would a mouse. Um, Seem good to get home, Gus, says she, innocent. Oh, you bet, says he, and sets down in the patent rocker and begins smoking his pipe. Oh, by me, he says soft, like you're speaking to hisself. I never knowed what I lost when I buried the first Miss Bogart. And he sighs heavy, looking up at the picture of the lady in the red dress. She certainly was the handsomest of the three, he says, thoughtful. And there wasn't a selfish hair in her head. Now, Miss Pettibone, if you'll take this waist off and put a shawl around you just for a minute, I'll stitch up the seams and give it another try on, and then you won't have to come again. Well, Emmeline, she stood it just for three days. Every time Gus come in the house, he'd go and stand mournful in front of the picture of the lady in the red low neck and short sleeve dress. Oh, she had beautiful neck and arms, white and round and a little more showing than ought to be by rights, while Emmeline was dark-complected and had all her dress waist padded out to make em look anyhow. Oh, good land, did I stick you with a pin? I ought to be more careful. Now, you set right down, Philora, and look at the fashions. I won't be a minute. The sound of the sewing machine, driven at furious speed, filled the silence while Mrs. Pettibone gazed unseeingly at the picture of a very tall pink-and-white lady in a low-necked gown. She was seeing, instead, an old-fashioned photograph of a woman with sweet, wistful eyes 
and a full curl of dark hair lying softly across her round white neck. There, said Miss Bennet, snipping off the threads. Now I'll slip this on and see how it is. You don't seem to gain much flesh, Mrs. Pettibone, and if you don't mind, I'm going to slip in just a mite of cotton under the lining. You'd rather not? Oh, all right. Oh, I can loosen up the goods and put a draped fichu across the front. They're wearing them this season, and they're a real godsend to thin folks like you and Emmeline Bogart. Oh, that's right. That puts me in mind. I didn't tell you what Emmeline done about the picture, did I? Well, as I was saying, she stood it for three long days. Then one morning, when Gus was to the store, she took down the picture of the beautiful lady with the black fan. She'd come to hate it be now. <laughs> and took it up to the attic and shoved it way back in under the eaves. But the crayon portrait of the first Mrs. Bogart she carried downstairs and washed its glass careful and hung it up over the sofa. She told me afterwards, when I was there making up her mourning for Gus, it looked real good to see it there. Says she earnest, I never knowed the first Mrs. Bogart, but I felt she was like a sister. And come to look, the picture wasn't that different from Emmeline herself being dark-complected and flat-chested and like that, with her hair done up on top and hair-pin frizzes. Emmeline never took it down no more except at house-cleaning time, and at Gus's funeral some of us noticed she'd put a wreath of white everlastings on the frame. The minister's wife had already reached the gate when she paused, aware of the patter of Miss Bennet's slippered feet in swift pursuit. Oh, land! If I didn't forget to ask you about them folks up to the Eggleston place, said the little dressmaker, and I had it in mind special. <laughs> but speaking of the third Mrs. Bogart, sort of shoved it back like you will a paper pattern when you're looking for something else in the bureau drawer. But Mrs. Pettibone appeared unable to add to Miss Bennett's meagre store of information. Do you mean to tell me, for your rice, that you don't know at all what kind of folks they be? Cross questioned Miss Bennett sternly. And you were going there twice already. You must have noticed something. Well, if they're real dressy folks, them that has silk linings to their everyday clothes and like that. Or if they're the sort that wears ready maids for best. Mrs. Pettibone considered gravely, her hand on the gate. Mrs. Hill impressed me as being a person of means and yes education she said with dignified reserve well prompted miss bennett casting her apron over her head in tardy recognition of her neuralgia shall i wear my best hair front and my black henrietta for em or put on my old brown they're not very social people i should say hesitated mrs pettibone at a loss to interpret miss bennett's question hm stuck up and proud inferred the dressmaker. Well, just the same, I shall wear my Sunday go to meetings. Let them know first off, I'm full as good as they be, if I do so for a living. I can protect my Henrietta with an apron, and I don't care if it takes a week to pick the threads off. And with that she turned and marched into the house. End of chapter 16 Chapter 17 of The Heart of Philura by Florence Morse Kingsley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 17 Where is Sylvia? Millie Orne opened the front door of the old Eggleston house to Miss Bennett's ring early the next morning. The girl looked very fresh and rosy as she smiled a discreet welcome. You're to come right upstairs, she said interrupting Miss Bennet's confident progress towards the living room. Everything's ready for you up there. Miss Bennet bristled slightly. I always used to sew for Miss Minerva in the setting room, she observed, as she followed Millie up the stair. The sewing machine was there, and everything handy. I remember I made her wedding dress. What's the matter? she interrupted herself in a loud, buzzing whisper. Is anybody sick? Millie shook her head. They don't like any noise about the house, she explained, 
as she ushered the dressmaker into a small room at the back of the house. "'Noise?' repeated Miss Bennet, adjusting her church toilette with little pulls and pats. "'Noise? Well, I declare, I didn't realise that I was, say, noisy. Where is Mrs. Hill?' Milly explained that Mrs. Hill had not yet breakfasted, and would Miss Bennet have some coffee before beginning work? "'Might be as good a way as any to get acquainted,' mused the little dressmaker. "'I can't sew half as well for strangers as for folks I know, so I don't mind if I do.' A bright pink overspread Milly's young face. She laid a coaxing hand on Miss Bennet's arm. "'I'll bring it to you up here,' she said. "'On a tray. That would be pleasanter, wouldn't it?' "'Well, I want to know,' piped Miss Bennet. "'That stylish idea never came out of your head, Milly Orne. "'And that's the kind Mrs. Hill is, eh? "'Oh, well, I don't know as I care. "'Forewarns, forearmed. "'And I can be full as sarcastic and like that as the next one. "'But I don't want no coffee. "'You can tell Mrs. Hill when you go downstairs. "'Tell her I ate my breakfast at home, same as usual.' and you can say Miss Malvina Bennett's perfectly able to walk downstairs soon as it comes dinner-time. When Mrs. Hill finally appeared at the door of the back bedroom, which she had ordered Milly to make ready for the sewing, it was to find Miss Malvina Bennett rocking her best frizzed front and her black Henrietta back and forth in front of the window with well-simulated ease. "'You're the seamstress,' inferred Mrs. Hill briskly. Miss uh, Bennett, our grocer, told me of you. You can make a plain morning gown, I suppose. Miss Bennett gazed searchingly at the strange woman's tall, stout figure over the top of her spectacles. She saw at a glance that she was wearing a real linen hand-embroidered dress. <laughs> Made up from an imported robe pattern, she told herself. Cost fifteen ninety eight, I shouldn't wonder. Aloud, she said dryly, I guess I could make out if I was to try. I sewed for the best people since I was fifteen. Miss Deaconess Buckthorn, Mrs. Revan Pettibone, and I have a pattern, interrupted Mrs. Hill, which may serve to guide you. Miss Bennet negligently indicated a pile of gaudily illustrated fashion books. I brought em along, thinking likely you wouldn't have seen em, she said loftily. They're the latest from New York and Paris. All you got to do is pick and choose the picture you like the look of. I don't need no patterns. I got my own system. The dress is for my son's wife, Mrs. Walter Hill. You, um, I suppose Mrs. Pettibone has spoken to you of Mrs. Hill? Miss Bennet shook her head her lips compressed to a thin line. "'I don't never gossip,' she said decidedly, "'in the shop or when I go out, which ain't often, and only to accommodate special, like of course to you. I ain't no news-gatherer. Anybody that knows me'll tell you that.' Mrs. Hill turned abruptly from the bureau drawer, whose contents she was laying out upon a small table. "'That is a very good rule for a seamstress to make for herself,' she said coldly. "'Tain't a bad one for other folks when it comes to that,' cackled Miss Bennet. "'But I ain't what you call a seamstress. I'm a regular dressmaker. "'Now, if you'll just bring the young lady here till I can get her measures, "'I can be draft in a pattern. "'I don't like to let my time go to waste.' Miss Bennet's head was tilted slightly to one side, she gazed aggressively at the woman in the hand-embroidered linen gown. For two cents, she told herself, I'd walk down them stairs and out the front door. She don't like my looks, and she hates like poison to fetch the young woman where I can talk to her. Like enough, she's got something id, and she's trying desperate hard to pretend she ain't. She's a hard, selfish woman, or I lose my guess. Oh, but Maybe I been sent. Who knows? Aloud, she said briskly, Can't do nothing till I take them measures. Mrs. Hill moved toward the door. 
i'll call my daughter she said her full dark eyes sweeping the little dressmaker with cold distaste left to herself miss bennett took a leisurely survey of the materials laid out upon the bed and bureau and her spirits rose anyhow she ain't no way stingy she said aloud as she measured off breadths of thin blue stuff lengths of embroidery and noted approvingly the number of spools of silk bolts of ribbon and cards of buttons that goods'll make up real pretty and dressy once i get my shears into it ten minutes more passed happily in a search through the fashion books in pursuit of what miss bennett called negligees these were numerous and attractive but the study of them palled after a while my stars alive exclaimed the little dressmaker indignantly that woman must think i'm working by the piece well she'll find she's good and mistaken when i go out special to accommodate it's by the day whether i set sewing or idle she tiptoed cautiously to the door and applied her ear to the keyhole no sound came from the passage without then she boldly opened the door i didn't make no contract to stay in this one room constant that i know of she muttered as she stepped out land i guess they clean forgot i was here open doors to the right and left revealed bedrooms into which breeze and sun streamed cheerfully miss bennett's bird-like glance took swift note of snowy bed linen and the glisten of silver and ivory toilet articles as she stole hesitatingly toward the stair she was thinking she'd find milly milly would know when suddenly a voice from the hall below broke the silence it was low and tense walter walter what are you doing what am i doing what do you suppose reading a dreary novel as usual came the reply in a man's drawling voice where is sylvia i left her here with you i can't find her anywhere you left her poor old girl isn't she to stroll in the garden even if she feels like it no not alone you know i never yes i know and see here mother let me tell you you're making a big mistake you say she went out when not ten minutes ago good lord mother one would think go look for her quick quick i say take your horse miss bennett beat a noiseless retreat at the sound of a hurried foot on the stair she sat turning over the leaves of a fashion book by the window when mrs hill appeared the woman's large face wore a determined smile uh, has uh, have you seen anything of young mrs hill she asked her eyes searching the room i thought perhaps oh, no no she ain't been here replied miss bennett maybe she's gone to a walk i seen somebody in a pink dress a spell ago cutting across the back lot it's nice and cool under the trees on a day like this mrs hill's plump hand sought her heart with an uncertain gesture she sank down in a chair while a flood of dull purple swept over her pallid face it's very warm she stammered thickly i feel the heat i guess you've been dashing round considerable looking for young miss hill hazarded miss bennett kindly why not let me and milly go look for her we're both of us light on our feet fleshy folks that wears their clothes too tight the woman was staring at her dully yes y go quickly you saw her she had on a pink dress i, I can't milly orne dropped the spoon with which she was stirring some fragrant compound at miss bennett's first explanatory word the dressmaker stood staring in amazement at the girl's swift flight in the direction she had indicated i want to know cogitated miss bennett as she followed at a more leisurely pace what in under the canopy can be the matter with that young mrs hill to set everybody by the ears like that she must be crazy or something with due regard to the black henrietta cloth in which she was attired miss malvina avoided the fence at the rear of the old pasture 
there was a gate she knew farther on and beyond the gate a path leading through a daisied meadow well i declare she murmured if i was free and idle to walk right out in the flowers like this seems as though i'd be happy i dunno when i've been out in the real country like this a walkin there were wild strawberries ripening in the meadow miss malvina could smell them as she hurried along the path her black skirt swishing the tall grass on either side what i give to have on an old calico dress and wade right into the grass a strawberry in she said to herself i ain't had a chance to do nothing like that since i can remember Ooh, and wild strawberry shortcake with cream Ooh. there was a glint of pink showing beside a big grey rock a dozen rods ahead miss malvina strained her faded eyes hopefully but it was only a wild rose in a glory of evanescent bloom around the shoulder of the hill was the placid pool known as eggleston's pond i wonder if she could have gone there pondered miss malvina and all unconsciously quickened her steps the water lilies had been blow maybe maybe and now miss malvina caught the glint of blue water amid the soft green of willows crowding like eager children to the water's edge among the sturdy trunks of oaks and beeches and yes she saw a motionless blur of warm rose on the brink of the pond there was a big rock there shouldering boldly out into the pool and beneath its shadow the water lay deep and dark the little dressmaker stooped to gather a spray of wild roses her heart beating in her throat i gotta be kind of careless as if i was out for pleasure and just running across her casual she told herself there ain't no telling what's in that poor young creature's mind a settin there lonesome on the edge of that water but from what i seen and heard already i should say she didn't have it none too pleasant to home what with a husband like that walter and a ma-in-law at miss bennett's approach the girl lifted dull abstracted eyes from her fixed contemplation of the pool but she did not speak oh, good land cried miss malvina briskly you certainly have found a nice cool place to set down and rest ain't you it's real warm in the sun i suppose you're young mrs hill my name's bennett miss malvina bennett and i come up from the village this morning a purpose to make a dress for you but come to take your measures we couldn't find you nowhere and your ma she says the girl hunched a sullen shoulder toward the loquacious little dressmaker her dark eyes again seeking the silent mysterious depths on whose brink she was crouching oh you won't mind if i sit down a minute to get cooled off will you continued miss malvina rather breathlessly i says to your ma-in-law i'll step out and cast me eye around i says she was all et up and excited i suppose she kind of hated to see me a sittin there idle by the day at that but course i couldn't put my shears to the goods without i took your measures thinks i i bet that young lady's gone after water lilies oh ain't they handsome though makes me think of a night blooming cactus at mrs deaconess scrimger had one time you ever see one they call it serious cause it don't never open sect at night but i think i like the day blooming flowers best they're cheerful there's a regular little sunburst in every one of them lilies do you ever take notice oh land i wish i had a scow we'd get some of em to take home there used to be a fishing boat tied to the willows and t'other side but i see it sunk to the bottom the girl sighed uncertainly it was a piteous sound suggesting a spent sob miss malvina put out her worn little hand and touched the girl gently now you come on home with me miss hill she said coaxingly and we'll make up them handsome goods into the prettiest dress we can find in the pictures there's a lady in colours on the outside cover it looks a lot like you i don't want any dress said the girl 
in a low, smothered voice. "'Go away, please, and don't tell Mother where I am.' Miss Malvina pushed back her best frizzed front from a forehead on which beads of perspiration were beginning to glisten. It, well, if I do, she said desperately, like as not you get dizzy and fall in that bare water. It's awful deep right by that stone. I know, cause a boy he got drowned there when I was a girl. Land, if I was Philura Rice, or her as twas, she's Mrs. Reverend Pettibone now, she'd know what to say. She'd tell you cheerful about the all encircling good with everything you want in it, ready to your hand. If it's folks you want special, or clothes, and like that, Philura found her husband that way. He was right there all the time, being the pastor, but he'd no more a thought of marrying Philura Rice, and I'll stick to that to my dying day. But believing the way she done, sort of drawed him right to her. He couldn't no more a help being drawed than a tack can help sticking to one of these ear magnums. Oh, you know, they're shaped like a horseshoe and painted red. I got one to my house with nails hanging to it like they was glued. The girl had turned and was staring wide-eyed. You say she found her husband? Was he lost? When? Where was he? Miss Malvina drew a deep breath. We can be talking while we walk along, she suggested cheerfully. Maybe somebody or other will come on us sudden if we sit here any longer. The girl rose obediently. She seemed to have forgotten the dark lure of the water. Well, you'll have to go and see Mrs. Pettibone for yourself, went on Malvina Bennett. Ask her to tell you. I don't rightly understand all there is to it, but I know as I could make out. The Reverend Pettibone... He was in the encircling good. Everybody's in it. You and me, and your husband, even your ma-in-law. Though like enough she don't sense it. Most folks don't. He was in it, and for Laura, being, so to say, alone in the world and kind of lonesome, just drawed him to her by her thoughts. It's enough to scare a body to think what they can do be just thinking careless, I says to for Laura. I wouldn't dares to advertise for no man that way, says I, for fear he'd show up and I wouldn't like him when he'd come. Oh, look there, if that ain't your ma-in-law, she sees us. Now you want to chirk right up. Don't go off no more by yourself. When you get that new dress, all made up stylish, come down to the village and see Mrs. Reverend Pettibone. She's an awful interesting woman. And she'll tell you how to get anything out of the atmosphere you want. Oh, and say, um, I passed the post office on my way home. I thought I'd mention it, in case you was writing to any of your friends. The older Mrs. Hill was close upon them. Sylvia, she cried, her breath coming in great gasps. Sylvia! The girl looked at her from under mutinous brows. Oh, good land, Mrs. Hill, wasn't no need of your getting all et up, expostulated Miss Bennet. I ain't going to charge you a cent for the time I spent walking out. Me and young Mrs. Hill enjoyed every minute of it, didn't we, Mrs. Hill? Looking at the water lilies and all. It was dusk, with a glimmer of fireflies in the dark trees, when Miss Malvina, carrying a flat paper parcel, hurried along the narrow road leading to the village. She had done a good day's work, she knew, and in the pocket of her dress reposed a letter, slipped unseen into her hand as she draped the runaway of the morning with becoming folds of the dark blue stuff. I can finish this ear dress to home in my shop, she had explained to her new patron, and I'd a sight rather do it, not relishing my vittles et solitary off a tray like I was sick a bed which, thank the Lord, I'm well and expect to be, D.V., as Miss Deaconess Buckthorn always says, pious-like. I suppose it stands for don't ventilate. And I will say, too many draughts ain't good for my neuralgy. 
arrived at last under the glaring arc-light which the enterprising citizens of innisfield had placed directly in front of the post-office miss malvina slowly drew the letter from her pocket if i was to give one look at the writin she reflected i couldn't no more help speaking of it than a sparrow can help chirpin so i guess i'll just shut my eyes whiles i a depressing sense of the irreparable swept over miss malvina as she slowly turned away after hearing the letter flop smartly against the bottom of the official box tain't human not to wonder who it's too she breathed and i don't suppose she'd a cared a mite neither me taking an interest and like that anyway that ma-in-law of hern will never get her hands on to it it's u s mail from now on and i done my best End of chapter 17chapter 18 of the heart of philura by florence morse kingsley this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter 18 wings of the morning there are nights in summer which are not meant to be wasted in sleep for a magical veil woven from moonlight and dew and the fragrance of a million flowers transfigures the prosaic world of labor and sorrow into a place of wondrous delight on nights like this one who foregoes his sleep to wander forth into the enchanted land of fairy may see and hear much that is hid from the wise and prudent who tarry bedfast till daybreak under the roof of the old eggleston house milly orne lay wide-eyed in her narrow bed outside her window in the topmost branches of a blossoming catalpa a bird sang drowsily sweet snatches of matin's song a pair of catbirds were nesting there and the little brown father of the fledglings safely folded under the mother's breast waked and slept on his swinging bough and waked again in the broad light of the moon to ease his heart of its dream of love it must be near morning thought milly who had also slept fitfully being dimly aware of the moonlight flooding her dingy little room and of the bird song and fragrance beneath her window she arose after a little and bound her long hair about her head if at nightfall she had felt weariness and the leaden desire to sleep both had vanished leaving her wondrous strong and light of heart she thought with sudden longing of the garden grandfather orne had pridefully laid out for grandmother back in the fifties it had been sadly neglected in milly's absence lusty weeds flaunting their coarse leaves in the queer old-fashioned rounds and squares sacred to the delicate blossoms of bluebells lilies and sweet williams it would soon be daylight thought milly but surely the night was her own to do with as she willed and so almost before she was aware of her resolution she had passed softly through the sleeping house and out into the magical night high in the bridal white of his chamber the bird trilled softly while half hid in the unshorn grass dew-drenched sprays of honeysuckle and roses yielded their perfume as the girl's light garments brushed past them like a spirit she flitted down the long avenue of trees unaware of following eyes as wakeful as her own the two old people lay heavily asleep in their bedroom next to the kitchen milly paused under their window propped open a hand's breadth and listened smiling to the raucous concert of their breathing the old dog had roused from his mat on the doorstep with a smothered bark only to whine and fondle the hand held out to him perhaps he was well used to seeing a sweet young ghost flitting among the flowers of a moonlight night for he retreated to his place and lay down his wise old head on his paws his eyes which saw things not to be uttered or understood following the movements of the girl it was no easy task to distinguish between the coarse textured leaves of encroaching weeds and the rightful denizens of the garden beds the moon swinging halfway between zenith and horizon shed only a mystic half-light over the sleeping garden to her vexation 
Milly perceived that she had rooted up more than one of the thrifty four o'clocks and petunias, their velvet cups close shut against the dew. After all, toil belonged to the day, and in this old garden, asleep and breathing perfume, there were no weeds. The magic of the moonlight had touched them all with beauty. So Milly trod the worn paths, her feet making no sound on the soft earth, her hands caressing the nodding blossoms, and her fresh lips brushing the dew from their petals, while the moon swung lower in the west, and along the eastern horizon a faint glow, dim and mystical as the heart of a sleeping rose, betrayed the dawn. Then all at once the birds awoke, with soft twitters and half-uttered trills. Nestlings began to cry weakly for food, thrusting callow heads against the shielding breasts that brooded them. The old dog rose from his mat, yawned, turned thrice around, and lay down again, his wise head on his paws, his yellow eyes following the girl's light figure. Or was it merely the familiar ghost which always vanished at daybreak? Milly had gained the road, her hands filled to overflowing with flowers, her thoughts as wild and free as the birds flitting overhead in the blended light of dawn and dying moon. She felt no fear, and but little wonder, when at the turn of the road she met him. "'What a night!' he sighed. "'And you, you're not a mortal woman, I swear, but a spirit. I think I'm afraid.' Milly looked at him gravely. "'What is a mortal?' she asked. "'And what is a spirit? "'And why should one be afraid, as you say, of either?' "'Hard questions, those,' he made answer. "'Yet it comes to me that I am also a spirit, "'and meeting thus, neither of us should be afraid of the other.' And whether it was the magic of the hour, or the pleading in his dark eyes seeking hers, Milly felt neither fear of him, nor shame, which is more cruel than fear. If in truth, he went on, you and I were not mortals, but spirits, I might say many things to you, and you would listen. I will listen, said Milly, eager as a moth at the lip of a flower. Well then, I have been unhappy, being bound with a hateful chain, which after all is not a chain, but a silken web, spun in secret out of fear and pride. I was asleep when the chain was laid on me, but now I'm awake, and I see that I must break it, for your sake and my own. The girl turned her glorified face toward him, the rose of dawn upon it. If I should pretend that I do not understand you, she said slowly, it wouldn't be the truth. Milly, he cried, you know that I love you. Yes, she breathed, I know. And I love you. But when, being mortal and a man, he would have clasped and kissed her, she drew away, regarding him over the mass of flowers she held against her breast, her face in the light of the living dawn, gravely sweet as that of an angel. There is the chain, she said. It lies between us. Have I not said? It is not a chain, he cried, but a web of lies. It shall not separate us. I am not. But she halted the words on his lips with a look. There are others to be thought of, she reminded him, and he groaned aloud. But not for always, he said. Not for ever, Milly. Oh, Milly. And now the moon had altogether vanished from behind them, and its magic light lost in the flood of honest day which streamed full in their young faces. The girl looked at him steadfastly. "'We've both forgotten many things,' she said sadly. "'It's not possible to unsay words once they're spoken. "'I would to God it were.' "'It is not possible,' he echoed. "'And thank God it's not possible.' "'And with that name upon his lips, "'took her hand in both his own, "'and stooping, kissed it with all reverence. "'Milly,' he said, whether you believe me or not, I have done you no wrong. To me, she breathed, you have done no wrong, but to another. And to another I have done no wrong, I swear it. I will tell you everything, and you shall judge. 
but at that she cried out tell me nothing she entreated just let me go she was only a woman trembling and terror-smitten now that the hour of her exaltation was past oh, let me go she wailed why did you come out to meet me as before he did not attempt to follow but stood watching her with troubled eyes till the last light flutter of her garments vanished on the green hillside i'm a fool he said aloud and smote his clenched fist in his palm for a long time thereafter he lay prone upon his face among the fern thinking the long long thoughts of youth which in truth take wings of the morning from deeps of black despair to heights dreamed of but never quite attained and yet it is good to fly end of chapter 18chapter 19 of the heart of philora by florence morse kingsley this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter 19 grandma orne speaks her mind grandma orne sat under the shelter of her small porch looking out with patient faded eyes over the old garden where long spikes of hollyhock and foxglove swayed gently in the light breeze it was nearing the hour of sunset and a warm yellow light brooded the garden and touched the tops of the apple trees with gold outside the palings lost in vines and luxuriant garlands of honeysuckle the road thick with dust wound away towards the hills the old woman had been sewing carpet rags and a big basket filled with the party-coloured balls stood at her side in the rocking chair beside her grandfather had fallen asleep his head thinly covered with wisps of white hair bent sideways from his half-closed lips the breath escaped in little puffs varied by an occasional snorting whistle grandmother glanced at him indulgently almost condescendingly she never slept in the daytime presently she got up from her chair and walked slowly to the gate her lips moving soundlessly she was thinking of milly and of the fact that for more than a week the girl had not visited the cottage i'd like to know what she's a doing she said to herself if she don't come up tonight i guess i'll have to go up there and see her thoughts reverted to the hill's evening dinners with rising indignation. <laughs> it's all them arty fiddles to get ready, she muttered. Meat and potatoes and such at night ain't good for nobody. Makes them fractious, like too much oats would a horse. If she'd a said in the beginning she wasn't used to no such nonsense, I guess that woman would a give in. The lads love petunias and mignonette growing luxuriantly in their humble beds gave out sweet odours as the old woman's skirt brushed past she came to the gate presently and leaning upon it looked up and down the dusty road with the submissive eyes of age no longer eagerly expectant of anything the sun was about to disappear behind a bank of purple cloud massed solidly upon the horizon like distant mountains Mrs. Orne gazed at it with silent disapproval. Then her eyes travelled slowly to the roof of the old house. Part of the blackened shingles had already been replaced with new, but there was a large patch where the stripped rafters lay open to the sky. Oh, didn't I warn Grandpa over and over not to let them boys rip off one more shingle than they was ready to lay, she muttered wrathfully. And Grandpa, he says to me, you go in and tend to your knitting, mother, he says. <laughs> Let some of them men folk come round the place, and it's wonderful how smart and knowing Grandpa does get all of a sudden. Seems like they kind of encourage each other in foolishness. Well, if it sets in for a good steady rain come tomorrow, maybe Grandpa'll wish he'd listen to me. She turned her back on the threatening sunset to gaze once more toward the bend in the road where her granddaughter's slim figure had so often appeared on its way to the cottage there were two figures there now 
vaguely outlined against the parched growths of midsummer. The old woman strained her dim eyes upon them. Looks like Milly. There's somebody else. Might be Will Craddock. He gets down this way sometimes. Oh, no. Tain't Will. He ain't so tall. Now, who can it be? She's talking to him, turning her face up to him like a flower. She's got that same pretty way of looking out her eyes as our Milly had. Awful sweet and innocent. Oh, she don't know no more than a baby. I never told her. Maybe I ought to have told her. No, that ain't anybody I ever see before. Unless, my grief, it's that feller as rides past here on a brown horse. Him that lives there. But he's married. The two were close at hand now, walking slowly. Mrs. Orne, her small bent figure half concealed in the shadow of a lilac bush, peered out at them fearfully. She saw that Milly was looking down, her face pale in the yellow light that flared up from behind the sullen cloud bank in the west, and that the man's tall head was bent. He was talking to her in low, urgent tones. You believe me, don't you, Milly? the old woman heard him say. The girl, looking up suddenly, caught sight of the pale, watchful face behind the gate. She waved her hand in greeting. Oh, it's Grandmother, she said hurriedly. No, don't wait, please. But Mrs. Orne had stepped outside, her old eyes flaming. You seem to got pretty well acquainted with my granddaughter, she said, staring fixedly at the tall young man. He stopped short, hat in hand. How could I help it, he said, smiling. You don't mind, I hope, Mrs. Orne? Yes, I do mind. You've got the same nice way with you. I seen that before now. But being a married man, I didn't think to warn Milly against you. Grandmother, protested the girl. The old woman turned fiercely upon her. Go in those, she commanded. I got a word to say to him. I know his nice, smooth-spoken kind. Go in, I say. The girl cast a proud glance at the man as she passed in at the gate, and he smiled reassuringly at her. Mrs. Orne watched her granddaughter as she trod lightly between the borders of sweet-smelling flowers. Then she faced the young man, who stood regarding her perplexedly. You was trying to make her believe something, she said sharply. What was it? Why, really, Mrs. Orne, he protested. I... Have you been making love to Milly? Answer me straight. He stared at her, his dark brows gathered over his troubled eyes. I haven't said anything I'm not willing to stand by, he broke out after a prolonged pause. I'll tell you that much. Oh, I ought to be obliged to you for your kindness, I suppose, sneered the old woman. Maybe your wife could tell me what sort of a man you are. He moved away a few steps. Oh, um, permit me to say good night, he murmured. Come back here, cried Mrs. Orne, stamping her foot. Her usually mild, good-tempered face was distorted with fury, and she seized him by the wrist. I'm a going to tell you something about Milly, she hissed in his ear. And she don't know it no more than a baby. I never meant she should. She's growed up here along all of us, just like one of them posies, sweet and innocent and good. And I wanted she should stay so. I wanted she'd marry a good, honest man and take care of her when we was dead and gone. Lord! <laughs> Tears rushed into the fierce old eyes and she raised her apron to wipe them away. Mrs. Orne, he began slowly, I wish you would believe me when I say, Believe you, she cried shrilly. Believe you? I won't believe a fellow like you with your hand on the Bible. Her mother was fooled into believing a nice, good-looking, smooth-spoken chap like you. And what she get for it? Her heart broke in two. Shame and black looks and a grave. I can show it to you over there in the cemetery. 
that's what she got for believing and you suppose i'm going to let little milly all we got left in the world do you think for a minute i'm going to stand back polite and fearful of my betters the way you expect an old woman like me to leave you to trump her down in the mud you got to go past me first he drew a hard breath and squared his young shoulders look here he said under his breath you've had your say and now i'll have mine this is a devilish world i'm beginning to think but i he stopped short his teeth set hard on his nether lip i'm waiting to hear scoffed the old woman i wish you'd take a good look at me he broke out desperately you've taken a lot for granted that isn't true you aren't fair something in his boyish voice touched her she took him by both arms and turned him towards the waning sunset light maybe i've said too much she mumbled maybe i she peered up at him straining to her tiptoes her withered hands gripping the lapels of his coat he submitted to her inspection his angry honest eyes staring down at her don't tell her what you told me he begged oh god it's too brutal his voice broke and the old woman suddenly released him maybe i said too much she repeated humbly but i'm awful feared of strangers i'm awful feared you needn't be afraid of me he said roughly but you won't tell her she shook her head mumbling wordlessly to herself would hurt her you think yeah oh, yes you're right she's like one of them tall posies in the garden say you wouldn't tromp a white flower in the mud would you she heard his sharp drawn breath saw the blood leave his dark face you wouldn't she begged all the fury gone out of her tremulous old voice me and grandpa set an awful store be milly she's all we got left and you wouldn't do nothing to hurt her don't he groaned for god's sake don't he turned and strode away his feet making no sound in the thick dust of the road from behind the solid rampart of cloud the last gleam of yellow light shot upward flickered and faded milly bent a troubled questioning gaze on her grandmother as the old woman hobbled slowly into view around the corner of the house mrs orne made a pretence of gathering some fallen bits of cloth from the floor of the porch uh, it's, uh, it's going to rain grandpa she said raising her voice i told you twad this morning and all them shingles ripped off rain scoffed grandpa it ain't going to rain just to spite me the lord don't care a cotton hat what you told me this morning grandpa on you'd better be careful the way you talk we ain't no more than chaff in the mill race ready to be swept away lord lord her voice rang out in a shrill crescendo oh don't holler so ma protested the old man me and milly ain't deaf be we milly the girl was looking up anxiously at the sky and the dismantled roof i'm afraid it is going to rain she said and the roof oh it's open right over your bedroom you'll have to move to the other side i'll help you grandma and then i must get back before it's dark i ain't going to let you go back no more milly you've been gone long enough me and grandpa needs you the girl had risen from her seat on the doorstep we'll move the bed into the kitchen she said then i must go her face with its clear pure outlines shone like a pearl in the dusk of the little bedroom as she began to strip off quilts and pillows did you hear what i said to you asked mrs orne almost timidly or was you thinking about about something else i heard you grandmother but i can't leave them now without warning it wouldn't be right both women were silent 
taking refuge from each other's questioning eyes in the task of taking down the old bedstead and carrying it to the kitchen. Oh, if only Grandpa hadn't been so brash, muttered Mrs. Orne. I warned him not to let the boys rip off the shingles reckless the way they done. But he's so set in his ways, Grandpa is. Milly smiled absent-mindedly as she spread the coarse sheets over the straw mattress. Poor Grandfather, she murmured. Poor Grandfather, echoed Mrs. Orne sharply. Whatever made you say that? A body would think I was crazy. I, I, I guess I got some sense. I can see through a millstone with a hole in it as good as an next one. I don't want you should go back there. You've been there too long already. Milly's lids drooped. Why, why did you speak to Mr. Hill the way you did? She asked rather breathlessly. Why should he be talking to you? That's what I want to know. Why should he be a walking alongside of you, bending his head down like he was, you was, and him a married man? The girl stooped and laid her cool, fresh cheek against the withered one. There was mute appeal, mute confession in the fleeting caress. But the old woman, all her fears once more aroused and clamouring, perceived nothing. Well, you, you've got to be awful careful of strange men, honey, she stammered. Oh, he looks nice, I know, but you don't want to believe nothing he says to you. I oh, ain't never liked to tell you how dreadful wicked some folk is. Seems too bad to spoil all your pretty white thoughts. Oh, but honey... Sometimes nice, smooth-spoken folks will tell the blackest of lies. May God reward them according to their works. But, Grandmother, oh, yes, honey, yes, you're going to tell me you know I eat better than I do. Young folks always think that. An old woman like Grandma, what can she know? That's what comes into your mind. You can't help it. It's nature, I guess, to believe the world's made over new for every generation. But it ain't. Oh, Lord, no. Things goes on about the same. You won't believe nothing he tells you, will you, Milly? The girl made no answer. Through the open window came the distant mutter of thunder, and Grandfather's grumbling monotone as he gathered up his garden tools. Drat the rain, it's a coming sure, and me a thinking by the feeling in my bones twas set fair for another two weeks. Oh, looks like Grandma had scared it up just to spite me. Milly dropped a light kiss on top of the old woman's cap. Don't worry about me, Grandma, she murmured. I'm not so foolish and ignorant as you seem to think. I'll be careful. She was gone the next instant. Mrs. Orne heard the gate slam shut behind her, and her husband's voice upraised in shrill warning of the approaching storm. Oh, Lord, she quavered, I can't see an inch in front of my face. Maybe you know about that fellow. I don't. Does look like there wasn't no use of praying. You know you didn't lift a finger to save our Millie, unless letting her die was saving her. We don't know nothing about what comes after. And even if it's all pearls and gold up there, and folks flying round with wings, and wearing crowns and a playing on harps, it don't seem to do us much good. If you don't take care of little Millie, I don't care for no harp nor no wings. They wouldn't comfort me none. Don't lay it up again, her lord, that I ain't prayed for so long. Maybe you wouldn't blame me none if you was to realise what I've been through. Oh, Lord, Lord. A broad flash of lightning illumined the darkened room and the bent old figure rocking back and forth distractedly on the edge of the bed. "'Why in creation don't you light the lamp, Ma?' demanded Grandfather's wrathful voice from the door. "'Here I be, and knocking my shins up against them plaguy chairs, and I tip something over out there. I don't know what it was, but I kind of sense things are rolling off onto the ground.' "'My ball 
calls a carpet rags exclaimed grandmother brought suddenly back to earth oh, land if i ever did see such a man in the dim light of the kerosene lamp the two old people gazed anxiously at each other some folks is a going to get ketched in this here shower quoth grandfather i hope it won't be milly oh she can run like a streak she'll get there before a crash of thunder drowned the words and then followed rain rain beating upon the new shingles overhead and dripping through the stark rafters above the empty bedroom mrs orne moved slowly across the floor twon't hurt her none to get wet she said musingly tain't that that's a worryin me the lightnin's enough to frighten anybody quavered grandfather i'm afraid the little girl'll get scared of the thunder hmm. well it's good for girls to get scared once in a while muttered grandmother darkly if that's all i was afraid of oh lord lord end of chapter nineteen